It's hard to see, but Congress is getting younger all the time. A new cohort of freshmen have shaken up both parties on the Hill, and one of those shakers is Representative Peter Meyer of Michigan's 3rd District, formerly the seat of Justin Amash, who exited the GOP just a couple of years ago before flirting with a libertarian presidential run. Meyer is a really thoughtful guy on matters ranging from war and peace to climate and modernizing welfare. We talked about the conclusion of U.S. operations in Afghanistan and how to rein in the presidency from its decades of free range to invade, bomb, or surgically strike whatever any president might feel like. Meyer has worked hard to repeal various authorizations for use of military force that date back to 1957 and are still in effect, which is absolutely insane. And he has been a Republican outlier in his support for a fact-finding mission around the January 6th event at the Capitol. We get into that and how the emergency governance mindset that has crept from 9-11 all the way to COVID-19 and what's at stake if we don't get a grip on that emergency mindset? Of course, I also had to ask Representative Peter Meyer about his thoughts on universal basic income, so be sure to stick around for all of that. I'm Stephen Kent, and this is Right Now. Let's dive in. Well, Congressman, you represent a number of things in the House of Representatives, chief among them, I think, generational change. You and I are about the same age, which is really cool to see for anybody serving in Congress. I think you and I probably share a lot of like the same memories and sort of hinge points about how America got to be in the state that it is today. And chief among them, you know, 9-11, the war on terror. And we just passed 20 years of engagement in Afghanistan and are finally now headed towards the exits. How are you feeling about our planned military uh, withdrawal here in the next 30 days, given that you were a child when this thing began, that you served, and now you are in Congress to watch it end? It's certainly a mix of emotions. Um, I had one reporter ask me when the uh, initially, you know, the Biden administration uh, said that they were going to accelerate that withdrawal. and. It was a move I supported under President Trump. It's a move I supported under President Biden. Uh, but it's definitely not a move that I think anyone is looking at with joy. Uh, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off. It's it's a, a painful experience, even more so for those of us who have memories or who have lost friends and colleagues. Uh, I was just reading an article from The New York Times earlier today about the battle for Kandahar City. And that's a place I spent a year of my life. I have a lot of Afghan friends who are still there. So it's it's heartbreaking. Uh, it's frustrating to see it reach this point. Uh, but at some point, you need to acknowledge that a military solution is not a solution here. This is a political conflict being fought through military ends, and it will only be a political settlement that will end this conflict once and for right. all. I think, I think the economic concept you apply to something like this is sunk cost. And, you know, there's only so much one can do. But I have to imagine that your view of this is complicated just by the news that broke over the weekend. I think it was last night that the Taliban have seized up to this point five different cities, provincial capitals. Uh, as of Sunday, the city of Kunduz is absolutely scorched. The photos are horrific. Um, do you look at what is happening so fast right now with the Taliban reasserting control as we head for the exits? as changing any of the calculus for what needs to happen in the next 30 to 60 days? I honestly don't. I think it, well, if I look at a lot of the provincial capitals that have been taken, uh, Zaranj and Nimruz, I mean, that was always a, a very far-flung locale. Kunduz had fallen to the Taliban before. Uh, in fact, I, I had worked with some of the individuals who were killed in a U.S. airstrike on the ICRC hospital in Kunduz, I believe in 2015. So it's, Again, this, these are not easy questions. This is going to be a long uh, road for the Afghan government to reassert its sovereignty and, and frankly, acknowledge uh, its own limitations and constraints. Uh, I wish that we had more coordination with our NATO allies. I, 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 I will not say that there are no elements of what's occurring that don't deserve some criticism. Uh, but again, on the whole, uh, I don't know that if we would have waited 20 more years and done the same thing, it would be any different. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much am looking at that two decades of time thing and then hearing the same choir of voices from the conservative right saying that more needs to be done, that if we just give it more time, something will work out. 
it's not going to. We don't live in a perfect world and there are no clean solutions to something like this. We have made choices and we've got to move forward. And I, I think one of the things that I am most encouraged by just in the past couple of weeks has been the U.S. stepping up to get our allies, translators out of the country. They arrived in Dulles just a couple of weekends ago. Is there anything more that we can do to Afghans who stepped up to help the United States in that country and who are now in harm's way besides just airlifting out strategic allies? Well, that, that's going to be first and foremost, you know, we had the special immigrant visa program for uh, interpreters who had worked with U.S. forces. Um, that program has been long neglected. I even wrote an op-ed about this under the Obama administration in 2012 uh, about how we were not utilizing that program or we're slow rolling it. So I certainly think that that is the least we should be doing is making sure that we get our interpreters out of there. And the Obama, the Biden administration uh, was very slow on the ball on this. I'm glad to see they finally started taking action. We have a strong contingent, a bipartisan contingent of mostly military veterans, some from the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, others from Vietnam, who've been pushing this very hard, uh, led by you know, Democrats like Jason Crow and Seth Moulton. Uh, so we've been working that angle very strongly. But Again, we need to be acknowledging the fact that a lot of folks believed in the U.S., helped our project along, uh, helped serve our mission, and we can't leave them behind to a certain death. Uh, the interpreters are definitely the most critical category in that, uh, but there are many others that we need to be looking at. How do we ensure their long-term safety uh, and, frankly, ensure that even if it's only a temporary program in the U.S., that we still have these individuals around to help rebuild Afghanistan um, because you can't bring someone back you know, once they've been, um, once they've been lost. Now, I mean, your viewpoint on this, I'm, I'm strongly encouraged by it. And I guess a little bit of a political question, what is it about uh, Michigan's third congressional district where people who tend to sit in this seat understand this issue uh, and that there are no perfect solutions to the war in Afghanistan, you and your predecessor, I believe predecessor, predecessor before Amash as well, um, understood that this issue uh, was going to grind on forever and ever unless we withdrew. Is this something that your constituents feel strongly about? It certainly is, uh, but I even will take it further back in time to President Gerald Ford, you know, who was president when we had Operation New Life uh, to bring a lot of the individuals who had been serving the U.S. in Vietnam and bring them to the U.S. to resettle safely. Uh, that was a massive operation. Ironically, it was an operation that then Senator Joe Biden uh, did not support and objected to. But you know, we have a, a very close knit community here in West Michigan. We're very strongly faith based, and and love thy neighbor doesn't just mean you you keep that to within you know your neighborhood. I mean, it looks at the broader world. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of those individuals who came to the U.S. as part of Operation New Life are you know valuable members of the community. Our our business owners, our entrepreneurs, are our friends, our neighbors. We appreciate the fact that you know we are stronger when we're operating together. And and I frankly believe there are. Are a lot of Americans who were just born outside of our borders you know, who share that belief and hope and liberty and freedom. Um, and, and our country is stronger because of them. And the theme of trying to make sure that stuff like this does not happen again in the future, you've been on the front lines of the push by Congress to repeal numerous AUMFs, that's authorizations for the use of military force, a mechanism which grants the executive branch discretion in military operations, mostly in the Middle East. Uh, most recently, the 2002 AUMF has sort of come under scrutiny. I believe it also includes the one that you're pushing to get rid of, includes the 1991 AUMF. What is the tangible impact of getting rid of the 2002 AUMF? Frankly speaking, it won't have an impact on our current operations in the Middle East. Uh, the 2002 AUMF that underpinned our second war in Iraq, uh, the 1991 AUMF, which was for the first Gulf War, that is also still on the books, uh, in addition to a 1957 AUMF under the Eisenhower administration. I read about the 1957 was, one just yesterday, and I my, my brain hurt. I wanted to put my head through a wall when I read that that was still in effect. <laughs> No, but the, the challenge is you, you have these authorizations that are sitting out there waiting for a current or future president to creatively interpret them and then do an end run around any congressional constraints uh, in the short term. So the goal here is that Congress was imbued by the founders with these Article One responsibilities to declare war, you know, to, to raise an army, to, you know, have the power of the purse. 
um, the executive, the, the chief executive or president under Article 2, um, they're commander in chief, but they're still responsive to Congress to issue that authorization. And now we haven't declared war since you know the 40s, but we have obviously engaged in numerous conflicts that have been authorized through these authorizations to the use of military force. Um, you know, the, the biggest one, obviously, that we need to look at is the post 9-11 AUMF uh, that has underpinned not just our war in Afghanistan, but operations in close to 20 other countries uh, extended far beyond Al Qaeda and associates to groups that have been actively fighting Al Qaeda, uh, to groups that didn't exist on 9-11. You know, so that has been stretched beyond mere any recognition. Um, but first and foremost, we need to clean the slate of all of these defunct authorizations so that we can focus on having a thoughtful strategic replacement to the post 9-11 AUMF while looking at war powers more broadly in the next breath, because that's where we need to make sure that any future authorization is time bound, is geographically bound, and also has a much more firm mission set. Uh, so again, it's not just a blank check that Congress is writing uh, and, and members of Congress don't have to make, cast that decisive vote on whether or not to send you know, men and women into harm's way. I think Congress needs to take ownership of the conflicts that we've been paying for. And, and we need to make sure that at every stage there is congressional input rather than just writing off that power to the I president. Mean, you're absolutely right about the 2001 AUMF post 9-11. It has led to 41 operations in 19 countries, according to Reason Magazine, when they were covering your push to get rid of all of these different lingering uh, authorizations. and. Biden, I suppose, is a good example of how just because the framework exists, you're able to sort of take leeway uh, when it comes to military action. The airstrikes that he launched in Syria and in Iraq in February, he cited Article 2 of the Constitution as a means to do so because Article 2 allows for the protection of U.S. troops when they might be in harm's way. We have troops in 150 countries around the world. So it kind of leaves me wondering, like, well, if we have troops in so, so many different locations, well, of course, there's going to always be an authorization for the president to take action. How does Congress really reassert its authority um, beyond symbolic gestures? This is, the, this is the part where I guess I always come back to impeachments, right? Like there's a purpose for all the powers that you have in the House of Representatives, and I don't feel like your colleagues are inclined to use them. Yeah, well, if we separate conflicts into you know offensive conflicts, such as the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and defensive engagements, such as some of those strikes against Iranian-backed Shia militias uh, that have been attacking U.S. forces, I think obviously the far greater concern are those offensive attacks. That's how we get mired into endless conflicts. That's how we find ourselves um, you know, breaking something and then taking ownership of it, uh, only having to acknowledge that reality years or decades later. So I want to make sure that we are reducing that push into those offensive engagements uh, of choice. Uh, you know, we need to be thoughtful about how we constrain the executive in such a way that doesn't put American troops at risk, that doesn't create unnecessary prohibitions, but again, doesn't allow presidents to engage in military adventurism. You know, we need to have a foreign policy that is first and foremost, you know, diplomatic and intelligence oriented. We need to be much more closely engaged. The fact that our largest embassies today are in Kabul and Baghdad means we'll continually be looking at the wars of yesterday rather than doing everything we can to prevent and mitigate the conflicts of tomorrow. Am I correct that the language of the 2001 AUMF allows for uh, measures for the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against nations, organizations, and persons. So this is the war on terror sort of founding document that gives the, the government the power it needs to go after threats. Yeah, yeah. it's very broadly written. I, I think um, one of the things that I, I'm most concerned about these days the, is the, are the ways large and small in which the war on terror is moving back home within our own borders, turning inward domestically. Uh, in the spring, Robert Grenier, he was a former CIA officer who served in Afghanistan and Iraq, director of counterterrorism from 2004 to 2006. He wrote a quite disturbing piece in the New York Times arguing that the event at the Capitol on January 6th was something of a canary in a coal mine type event, and that we needed to turn the infrastructure of the war on terror, counterterrorism intelligence, inward towards our own population to combat political extremism, white nationalism. Um, 
you know, I, I know you've commented plenty on your vote to impeach the president over January 6th, and you support the commission to investigate it. So I would like to know how you think about the lessons of the war on terror and whether or not we should be applying similar tactics here at home to deal with homegrown threats, large or small. Yeah, if we think we learned lessons from the war on terror that are applicable at home, uh, really the only lesson is that when you start to, if all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And if you think that you can have a military solution to political problems, you are woefully mistaken. Right? And this has been a creep that we've seen for a very long time. We saw it with NSA surveillance uh, that started to dip into some domestic collection. Uh, we've, we saw it during the riots last summer when uh, some military assets um, and, and you know, border patrol assets started to be used for what are arguably domestic intelligence collection missions. Uh, it's a very slippery slope. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't go down it. Uh, ironically, after January 6th, there is a, a, a a very bizarre consensus uh, that you don't normally see where members of the squad were putting out documents or statements asserting that we shouldn't be going down the path of, of you know, a domestic terrorism overreaction, mm -hmm. you know, just like we saw um, to international terrorism after 9-11. Uh, there's been a strong consensus even among, you know, moderate Democrats, uh, you know, national security minded Democrats, again, that we cannot allow some of the excesses of the post 9-11 era that we've seen internationally to be applied domestically as well. No, I mean, it's it's um, very curious and telling, you know, the Democratic Socialists of, of Congress and also your more libertarian inclined members. Those are the people who get it. <laughs> those are the people who understand the excesses of the past 20 years and are concerned about government force. Obviously, the, the dem socs always go in the wrong direction when it comes to economic force and coercion. Uh, but I, I appreciate their concern over civil liberties, uh, even if they go in the wrong direction on other issues. It's, it's, it's a very novel feeling for me to read a document the squad puts out and to say, <laughs> oh, I actually agree with that. I mean, it, it only happens maybe one out of 100 times. Um, but, you know, on this issue, I think it's an absolutely understandable concern uh, because we have seen these tactics start to creep in. I mean, this um, the, the killology, you know, kind of fetishization of violence uh, stands in stark contrast to what has actually worked to resolve conflicts in a sustainable way. Does the politicization of the January 6th commission bother you at all? I suppose there's a certain element of House proceedings that just is naturally supposed to be politicized. It is a political body. It is of the people. It's always going to be that way. Um, but I while I support the commission happening, because it's always good to learn and have investigation, it does bother me that the commission's sort of founding documents, the founding bill that launched it, labeled the January 6th event domestic terrorism. Because isn't that the thing we're supposed to discover whether or not it is that? Whether or not it meets that metric of domestic terror? Do you think that that sort of sets it off on the wrong foot and there's something that we still need to learn? Well, and let me just be clear. So we had a, a bipartisan independent commission that was proposed. 35 Republicans joined all Democrats in voting in support of that back in uh, May, I mm, believe. Yes. Uh, and then the, it, it died in the Senate. And so uh, one of the one of the consequences that I was fearing was that this would become a reprisal of the Benghazi committee, you know, a select committee approach. Um, you know, that ultimately came to fruition. That's what is occurring right now. Um, you know, that I, I actually don't take issue with the phrase uh, domestic terrorism in, from a definitional standpoint. So if you look at what our statutory definition is, it's the application of violence, you know, to, to coerce, you know, a political end. Um, and I think that was exactly what many folks had intended to occur on January 6th, was to prevent the congressional convening and the certification of the Electoral College vote. That is a, a constitutional, you know, political you know, process that was interrupted. Uh, it was a, a, a gathering that was intentionally dispersed by individuals using violent means. Now, again, the, the more broad connotation of terrorism I think is something that's really problematic and troubling, uh, but we do need to, to segment between, um, you know, that ultimate concern, which is, is there violence here? And this is what we see with phrases like domestic violent extremism. There's a very big difference between, you know, the, the willy nilly throwing around of words like extremist and terrorist to talk about things that are nonviolent or to talk about issues of political disagreement 
That I find incredibly troublesome to start to conflate, again, nonviolent speech or nonviolent activity with violence. Those are two very right. different I, I sort of get really squeamish about the, the phrase domestic terrorism uh, and the idea that anybody who might have participated in the event fits into that category. Like, I believe it was a riot. It was, a, in, in many ways, an insurrection because exactly what you said, it interrupted uh, the process of government and the, the certifying of an election. And that matters. I think everybody who had a foot inside the building should be doing time in prison, I, I just, just point blank. It's just it's that element of like attaching sort of a, a planning to it, which I guess is the point of the the commission <laughs> to figure out who was planning here and then who got sucked into sort of a mob mentality in that situation. Because I think that there was both going on. Yeah, uh, there were there were thousands who attended, maybe maybe over 10,000 who attended and were peaceful and viewed it as a rally. Uh, there were hundreds who assaulted law enforcement who entered that building and who committed federal crimes. And then there were dozens uh, who had prior planning, some of these groups like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. Yeah. Um, some of their the documents that have been shared in the releases are, are chilling in terms of their strategy. I mean, these are folks who were in, in paramilitary gear operating in a stack uh, who were intentionally looking for members of Congress. They were not folks who were swept up in the emotion or swept up in the action, um, but those who were, were plotting in a calculated way. Um, and, and again, I, those are all the things that I hope uh, we'll get a better understanding of. I would vastly have preferred that this took place via a bipartisan independent commission removed from political pressures of the moment. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, the Senate, um, uh, they shot that down. No, I, I hear you 100 percent. And I, I really appreciate your commitment to nuance on this issue, because I know it is a, a tough position to straddle. Uh, not only when you're talking to media or you're talking to constituents, it's a it's a tough position to take. And you've remained principled on it. Um, you know, as someone who grew up in the same time as you, the war on terror era, governance via emergency powers, I think is one of the defining stories of our generation. We float from kind of one crisis to the next, and I think that is partially a government uh, creation, partially a media creation. But when you look at our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, do you see threads between the war on terror mentality and the war on the virus? that risk replicating some of the mistakes that we have made since the start of the century. Because whenever I turn on the television and I see everything being a state of emergency, a new crisis, I, I just wonder if we're drifting down the same road again, but this time for a public health issue. I think the broadest parallels I'll have is on the one hand, on the public reception side, uh, being very open to conspiracies, being very open uh, to all sorts of, of baseless allegations. I mean, if you think of some of the 9-11 truth or conspiracies, a lot of those are playing uh, playing out right now as well in kind of more, more fetid parts of the Internet. Um, I think the other strong parallel is a government that doesn't trust its own citizens with information. Uh, the CDC's messaging around this um, has been absolutely abominable. I mean, you, you go back to those early days when they were um, denying the presence of aerosolized transmission or being incredibly hesitant to adopt that um, and, and sowing distrust in simple measures like wearing a mask, you know, telling people emphatically not to do it. Again, I am a huge proponent of governmental humility. Because uh, it's a lot easier to say, listen, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. Maybe this is where our best guidance is. But that could change because there are some assumptions. I mean, give individuals that power. Treat them, the American public with some dignity and respect uh, when it becomes do this or you're going to die. You know, in, in Maybe that was the case. Maybe it wasn't. But again, those overly broad pronouncements, you know, when they were – found out to not be true or based on incomplete information, what that does is that sows mistrust. That was the biggest takeaway from the Bush administration's pandemic planning. Uh, they had a, a, a tabletop exercise um, in the later stages of their administration. And the number one takeaway was do not lose the trust and confidence of the public. Be honest about what you know. Be honest about what you don't know. And that's something that the CDC has violated time and time and time again. Not to mention stepping the way out of their lane here just in the past week with extending the eviction moratorium <laughs> for, until October. Uh, it's, this, is, this is bureaucracy and the federal government doing more than anybody asked them to do when they put together their job descriptions. I, it's, 
It's unheard of. Yeah. The, the, the Commerce Clause has been stretched beyond belief in a number of ways. But again, what gives a, a an unelected executive branch agency the authority to intervene and to, um, Housing to issue fines? <laughs> but yeah, between a, a private homeowner, you know, and, and a tenant. I mean, this is <laughs> I, I, it leaves me at a loss for words. I mean, but again, if you give the government power to do you know everything you want it to do, I mean, you, you are you are handing it the keys to perform so many potentially dangerous acts, and I think that's what folks don't understand. Is there is this political debate that says, you know, if only we can control the levers of governmental power, then we can wield them, rather than stepping back and saying, hey. We should probably not be given the government. Nobody these wants in the to first throw place. the ring back into the fires of Mordor. <laughs> not a single one of them. Uh, maybe you do. I hope you do. But on the positive side of things for the COVID response, I am somewhat encouraged by the shift toward direct cash payments by the government to help people uh, weather this storm, considering the size of the national debt burden. What do you think of as a takeaway for Trump and Biden's stimulus checks and the case for doubling down on ideas like basic income, rethinking welfare as we've known it since the 40s and 50s? Yeah, I mean, the cumulative per capita payments as part of the COVID stimulus were just shy of $15,000. Um, it's about two and a half times you know, what the New Deal was adjusted for inflation on a per capita basis. So these were Jeez. massive amounts that came. You know, I think one of the biggest issues that we had, uh, if I look back, and, and again, we're, we don't have enough time to fully look back in the mirror at what worked and what didn't. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges is you had so many competing and convoluted programs, some of which I think performed a very good service, um, but many of which helped relieve the burden or took the burden away from governors to be deciding, you know, how they should be acting in a judicious way. And so if they can just take their hands off and be risk averse or overly cautious because they think the federal government will back them up, now you're entering into a scenario where you're creating tremendous moral hazard up and down the line. And then you have elements like the eviction moratorium um, or you know some of the more recent action on uh, federal student debt, which the federal government should not be in the student debt business, but that was a Obama era transition. We have not fully appreciated the damage uh, that it's doing. But all of these different components that created so many incentives that could be manipulated. I mean, when we look at the federal unemployment insurance supplemental that went out and even state level um, unemployment insurance, uh, we're talking probably hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud that went out. Now, the positive side was that individual household income rose and individual household savings rose. Um, that's that's good. Uh, but the question is, at what expense to federal debt? At what And could those dollars that were spent have been spent in a more efficient and more effective way uh, to lend towards long term solvency? You know, I do think we need to be taking a, a far closer look when we look at the variety of federal um, kind of welfare programs that we have, can we deliver that more effectively, more efficiently? Um, and, well, and one of your one about. of your colleagues is at least thinking about this. Um, Representative Ilhan Omar put forward the Support Act, which would put up about two point five billion to fund basic income pilots. So this is universal basic income in communities nationwide, and then a national program in two thousand twenty eight that would give twelve hundred dollars a month to families capped, making seventy five thousand dollars a year. So it's not quite universal basic income. It is literally just a wealth transfer program. Do you have thoughts on on UBI and whether or not that is a policy that should be at least thought about on the Republican side of the aisle? I think it could be a worthwhile reform if it took the place of a number of existing programs. And I think one of my problems with the proposals being put out is that they are in addition to you know a, a plethora of various you know federal stimulus or federal welfare programs and just layering on one more income source rather than seeking to streamline all of those components. Right. If we are serious about making good on long-term fiscal solvency, if we're serious about making sure that social security works, if we're serious about making sure we're not consumed by our debt, we cannot just be layering on another program without taking 
a real close look and trying to consolidate as many existing programs as possible. So I can see some administrative efficiency in getting to the point where, again, we're not having 30 percent overhead on some of these welfare programs, but directly distributing it. That I could be down for, but not if it's something that's layered onto the cake and only adding to the federal. Yeah, it's, it's always layered on <laughs> with the Democrats. I think particularly like with Ilhan Omar, the Support Act uh, is not a universal basic income program because it's not universal. And it would also very likely be paired with demands that the eviction moratorium extend forever because they think housing is a right. So they'll want to create a basic income program and then also take away all things that you might call living expenses because they think everything is a human right. Right. Um, Representative Peter Meyer, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat and talk about some of this. Thanks for coming on right now. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Stephen. All right. Well, as the federal government tightens its grip over COVID variants predictably popping up worldwide and the not so closeted totalitarians such as Mayor Bill de Blasio allude to the use of coercion in vaccinating the public, there is some hope. While New York City and California lurch toward forms of vaccine passports to dine out, go to the gym and not be relegated to second class citizen status, Europeans, surprisingly, are stepping up where, for the most part, Americans look pretty beaten into submission. Italians rallied in the thousands in the streets of Rome to challenge the Green Pass, proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test, now required for indoor dining and attending sporting and cultural events. In France, 230,000 plus people marched in cities across the country to protest vaccine passports and mask mandates. In the Netherlands, Sydney, Poland, yes, Sydney is not really Europe, but you get the point. Thousands of people filled the streets in opposition to what I view as a culture sanctifying panic and dictatorial measures in the name of the illusion of safety. To say it's a trade-off between freedom and security is a lie. This is about people at the top with power, privilege, and wealth who think they can fool you into believing the world can be made perfectly safe if only the little people would stop being so selfish. Why else would you have Dr. Fauci on NBC over the weekend scolding bikers at the Sturgis motorcycle rally in South Dakota, but staying completely tight-lipped about Barack Obama's 60th birthday party featuring thousands of Hollywood and media guests? This is about control. So good on the people across Europe and Australia showing up to burn those green passes and protest and reminding the well-connected central planners that they don't have a blank check to keep pummeling everyday people with new regulations to work, play, and just exist. I hope Americans, I really hope they are watching and snap out of it before we find ourselves in a country where you can go out to a restaurant to eat and in the back alley, there's going to be a takeout window for the unvaccinated, the unclean 20%, the people holding out who are only risking their own lives. I believe in science. I got the vaccine. I'll get boosters whenever my doctor tells me to. And I don't lie awake at night afraid of the virus or any of its variants. But they want you to be so that they can do whatever that they want. So do two things, please. If you're able, get vaccinated and then stick up for the rights of your neighbor who doesn't. Don't tread on me is a cool slogan. Don't tread on anyone. Embracing that could really help fix the world. That's it for our show this week. I hope you will subscribe. We got new episodes every Thursday, so do hit that subscribe button and follow us on whatever podcast app you prefer. We're on social at Rightly AJ and would love to hear from you. In the meantime, Always ask why, stay out of line, and be a bug in the system. We'll see you next week.